Okay, let's get this show underway. Everyone, I'm Adam Goodhart, director of the CV Star Center for the Study of the American Experience, um, which even for those of you who know me, um, you may need to hear because I was away on sabbatical last year, and no doubt I look uh, much older and more tired and historical than I did the last time you saw me. <laughs> Not wiser. <laughs> Thanks, Frank. Um, and I'm happy to welcome everyone to our first event of what promises to be an exciting year. And if you didn't get it, pick up one of those flyers that tells you all about the semester ahead. Um, in a moment, I'm going to welcome Jim Rice to the podium. But first, I want to tell you a story about a house. In the heart of downtown Chestertown, some of you may know the spot well, stands a brick house that looks fairly ordinary from the outside, but is actually a seething container of American history bursting from its seams and a container of Washington College history. The house 103 North Queen Street is almost 300 years old. It's one of the oldest structures in Chestertown. During the American Revolution, it was the home of an officer in General Washington's army, a man who later served as this college's first treasurer. During the War of 1812, a man born in that house rode off to save Kent County at the Battle of Cox Field, which I'm sure some of you saw last weekend, if not in 1814. Um, and he later also saved Washington College itself from the brink of imminent destruction. During the 1960s, it was the home of a legendary Washington College professor, whom, joking aside, uh, I'm sure some of you did know, Norman James, um, who lived there with his family and saw, as his family told me, saw the Freedom Riders march down High Street right at the end of their block. Now, a new chapter of that house's amazing history started just a few years ago when this house started becoming home to some of the most gifted and exciting historians of our time. A major grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities, um, the largest federal grant that Washington College ever received, including those 50 guineas from General Washington himself, <laughs> allowed Washington College to buy and renovate the old house, along with several generous private gifts, and to launch an exciting new program, the Patrick Henry Writing Fellowship. The Henry Fellowship brings nationally eminent scholars to Chestertown for full-time writing residencies that last an entire academic year. The fellowship aims to encourage new insights into American history and its contemporary impact and to foster the literary craft of historical writing for broad general audiences as well as the scholarly community. The uh, recipient, as part of the fellowship, work in the Star Center, live in that old house on Queen Street that I just told you about, newly rebaptized the Patrick Henry Fellows Residence. Um, they teach a spring course at Washington College. They deliver at least one major public lecture, and that's where you are today. Um, and they participate in many other ways in the life of this college. Today, we welcome to Chestertown the 2014-2015 Patrick Henry Writing Fellow, James Rice, an accomplished scholar of early colonial America. He's professor of history at SUNY Plattsburgh and received his PhD right across the bay from here at that second tier Maryland institution, the University of Maryland. <laughs> after doing his um, undergraduate work at a somewhat bumpier place, Colorado College. Jim is the author of two books, the most recent being Tales from a Revolution, Bacon's Rebellion and the Transformation of Early America, published in 2012 by Oxford University Press. And if that book sounds familiar to some of you, it's because Jim was actually here in 2013 to deliver the Guy Goodfellow uh, lecture in history about that book. And apparently he liked Chestertown enough to want to come back. At least he didn't run screaming. Um, Jim, uh, before that book, published Nature and History in the Potomac Country, and that was published in 2009 by Johns Hopkins University Press. During his year in Chestertown, he'll be working on an exciting new project, the first book-length narrative account of the bloody 1622 assault by Native Americans on the English settlements in Virginia, and he'll be telling us much more about that in just a moment. And in addition to that project, if that weren't enough, 
He's also working on an environmental history of Native Americans in North America from the last ice age to the present day, and that's under contract with Cambridge University Press. As part of Jim's Washington College residency, he'll be teaching a spring seminar course titled Native America, Modern America. And to me, that's really the best thing about um, welcoming Jim to, to Chestertown, welcoming the Patrick Henry Fellow to Chestertown. You know, when we bring most of our eminent lecturers here, it's this sort of, you know, bing, bang, boom, and goodbye. We put them on the bus, or, well, there's no bus from Chestertown, but we sort of send them on their way from Chestertown the next, the next day. But with the Patrick Henry Fellow, we know that we're going to have him or her as part of our community for the whole year to come. I'd also like to welcome Jim's wife, Patricia Hebers Rice. And Patricia, if you can stand up for just a second so folks can see you. Um, and Jim and Patricia actually have a marriage with two historians in it, which is a truly frightening thing, I think. Um, but it's also, it's kind of a cool thing in their case because she's a scholar at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, and she's already been very generous in volunteering to come to classes here and share her expertise. Finally, I'll take a quick moment to thank our colleagues at the Eugene O'Neill Literary House, especially Professor Jean Dubrow, the director who co-sponsored the Henry Fellowship, um, as well as the National Endowment for the Arts and the other funders who created this fellowship. The members of this year's faculty selection committee who filtered through many, many applications before choosing Jim Rice, um, and President Griswold and Dean Chamley Wright for their support. Um, and now, hoping and looking forward to a year of making even more history here in Chestertown, let's welcome Jim Rice. So thank you, Adam, for that kind introduction. And uh, I must say, um, quite the opposite of, of running screaming after the Goodfellow lecture. I, um, before we had left town, I told Patricia I, I'm definitely applying for that fellowship and hope to be back. So I'm, I have a, a great many thank yous that I could give at this point, but I'll be here for nine months and hope to be a member of this community and to make clear how grateful I am and happy I am to be here. I first encountered the Powhatan Uprising of 1622 when I was four, five, six years old. I was a bloody-minded little boy, I think, um, if that's not redundant. And um, I, I encountered it probably in a Time Life book or something, along with other images of what were then called massacres. And uh, again, being a bloody-minded little boy, I studied them intently. Uh, I next encountered this event probably not even as an undergraduate, but as a, a new graduate student at the University of Maryland. And uh, at that point, I learned uh, what probably some, you know, some of you in this room already know, which is that this widely reprinted 1628 engraving from the workshop of Theodore de Bry commemorated the events of March 22nd, 19, uh, 1622, when Powhatan Indians launched a surprise attack against English settlements all along the James River. They had started infiltrating uh, English households the day before, uh, and this was no, not considered a big thing because there was a lot of interpenetration, a lot of interaction between natives and newcomers in 1622. They worked for each other, they traded uh, uh, English goods for fish and meat and this sort of thing, so it wasn't any, any seen as a big thing until the following morning when, uh, to quote one, uh, one, one contemporary, at a given signal, the Indians drew their weapons and fell upon us murdering and killing everybody they could reach, sparing neither women nor children, as well inside as outside the dwellings. Near, nearly a third of the colony's 1,240 residents were killed in the space of just a few hours. Over the next few years, as the story is usually told by scholars, English counterattacks broke the power of the in, uh, region's Indians, leaving the colonists in command of Virginia. The event, in fact, despite my ignorance during my undergraduate years, the event is actually a set piece of American history. It's a canonical episode. Uh, the authors of textbooks are apparently forbidden to leave it out. And uh, so much so, in fact, that the, today's market-leading textbook, Eric Foner's Give Me Liberty, with an exclamation point, um, dedicates nearly two pages to the Powhatan Uprising of 1622. And that's in the brief edition of a book that covers everything that happened before 1877. 
So this event, um, as you can see, uh, 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 was very much a surprise at the time, but historians have the advantage of hindsight. And again, as the story's been told, uh, the problem begins in 1622, or if you want to push it back just a little further to uh, the Roanoke colonies of the 1580s. Um, the problem was in this telling the mere fact of the presence of the English. I'm gonna give you again just sort of a consensus version of why this happened and how it mattered and so forth. And then I'm gonna double back a little bit in the last part of the speech and talk about uh, what I think is missing from the consensus version. Not that there's something wrong with the consensus version, but it's, it's an incomplete story. Um, the beginning of the story, again, is um, probably fairly familiar. In 1607, uh, a little over 100 Englishmen showed up, uh, sailed up the James River, and, and built themselves a little fort on an island now known as Jamestown Island. Um, and they had a rough couple of first years. Uh, people died in droves, mostly of disease, um, but sometimes from Indian attacks. Relations with the Indians in the surrounding area were um, rocky, but not always violent. They had found themselves, in fact, in the midst of uh, a large Native American polity that we, for shorthand today, call the uh, Powhatan Chieftain, uh, Paramount Chieftaincy, that uh, at that time uh, covered all of Virginia from uh, the James River to the south shore of the Potomac River and from the fall line down to the pay, bay and even exerted some influence on the lower uh, eastern shore. And so uh, the fact that a, a hundred or at one point in the winter of 1609, 1610, a couple of, a few dozen Englishmen could survive in the midst of this powerful Indian polity that numbered probably over 30,000 people says one thing, that Powhatan, the paramount chief himself, wanted them to or at least felt it was okay. Um, so uh, we know, I think, many, if, just from Disney alone, we know uh, that Pocahontas did cartwheels in the streets of Jamestown. We know uh, most of us uh, have, have at least looked at uh, another engraving that shows Captain John Smith um, in a very unfortunate and damaging instance, uh, incident, um, humiliating Apakan Canoe, the brother and sort of outer war and diplomacy chief of uh, the great chief Powhatan. Uh, we know that John Smith himself was captured and paraded around to different towns within the Paramount Chiefdom. Um, we don't know, but there is evidence that at the end of this parade around uh, uh, the, the main towns of the Chiefdom, he underwent, underwent a ritual mock execution, after which he was sort of ritually reborn and told by Powhatan, well, you're one of my subordinate chiefs now. Here's your new name. This is what we're going to call the English from now on. You're going to move from Jamestown. Here's your new town and here's the annual tribute you will owe us. We know that, uh, um, that John Smith turned out to be a terrible subordinate chief. <laughs> he, he didn't do any of that stuff. In fact, he went and sailed around the Chesapeake Bay a couple of times looking for allies against Powhatan and uh, never did, did deliver that, that, giant, that giant grindstone that he was supposed to. Um, we know that once uh, Powhatan and once the English really figured out where they stood, with each other, that war resulted. Understanding each other doesn't always lead to good feelings, right? So uh, from 1609 to 1614, the English and Powhatans were at war with one another. The, uh, there were a number of reasons the war ended, but what really sealed the end of the war was the marriage of Powhatan's daughter Pocahontas to a prominent Englishman, John Rolfe. It was uh, uh, apparently from, at least from John Rolfe's side, a love match, but it was also very much a diplomatic arrangement that was common within both Native America and for Europeans. So after six, the war ended in 1614, uh, there were several years of, of relative peace. Things started to sour in 1617, however. Pocahontas uh, here pictured in uh, English garb after her uh, marriage and after her baptism as a Christian. Uh, she, along with a large retinue of Powhatans and her husband uh, and some other dignitaries um, to England, died just as she was about to return home. And so with her died that, that diplomatic marriage. 
Also in 1617, her father, Powhatan, who at that point was probably, well, just about old enough to collect Social Security. Um, no, he's in his, probably in his late 60s, early 70s. Uh, he also retired, and um, in the following year, he died. He handed off the Paramount Chieftain to a brother, a Toyotin, who uh, was a little bit more of a hardliner than Powhatan had been towards the English. And uh, his, their, their mutual brother, Apakan Canoe, this outer chief responsible for war and diplomacy and so forth, uh, he stayed on in the same capacity, and he had always been something of a hardliner when it came to the English, and certainly after his humiliation by John Smith. So uh, another reason why relation, anglo powhatan relations started to sour in 1617 was that Jamestown finally was finding a reason to exist as a going concern, as an economic concern. Uh, there had been experiments with tobacco production as far back as 1612, perhaps 1611, depending on how you count it. And um, in 1617, tobacco exports reached 20,000 pounds. The following year, they doubled to 40,000 pounds and just kept going. Uh, so much so that even in 1622, the year of the uprising, uh, exports were at 60,000 pounds. Well, tobacco notoriously is a crop that, promotes, uh, that promoted uh, scattered plantations in this region. And as the number of Englishmen, still small, scattered out um, along the James River, they increasingly took up lands that the Powhatans needed or at least were interfering with their fishing and hunting activities and so forth. So uh, this was also very upsetting to the Powhatans. In 1620, the English added a new level of disrespect for their neighbors. Uh, one George Thorpe showed up uh, to spearhead a missionary effort to essentially to get Powhatans to stop being Powhatans. And uh, so this is not exactly a sign of respect, but by his, even by his standards, his fellow Englishmen uh, were not very kind to their Indian neighbors. He complained of his fellow colonists that, quote, there is scarce any man amongst the colonists that doth so much as afford the Indians a good thought in his heart. And most men with their mouths give them nothing but maledictions and bitter execrations. At some point in these years, Apakan Canoe began planning a coordinated assault against the Jamestown colonists. It came, was supposed to come no later than 1621. Uh, we know that it was no later than 1621, because a uh, uh, Werowance, a chief from the Eastern Shore, um, finked. <laughs> I don't know what, what, how else to put it, but, but revealed to the English that, that uh, this was in the works. And so uh, Apakan Canoe called everything off and launched a, a really intensive charm campaign. When two Englishmen murdered one of his most important warriors, he said, eh, no big deal, he was out of favor. You know, he was more Powhatan's man. Um, remember Powhatan had died, uh, and he even told George Thorpe, well, you know, I'm starting to wonder about this God of ours. I think I'm pretty interested in being a coming a Christian, and, and um, it worked. It worked like a charm. So um, consequently, on that morning of March 22nd, 1622, when these coordinated attacks all up and down James River were launched, the English were taken <coughs> utterly by surprise. The secretary for the colony, Edward Waterhouse uh, wrote that the blow was, quote, so sudden that few or none discerned the weapon or blow that brought them to destruction. A lot of English people were angry, uh, and they weren't shy about saying so. Think about this, before this uprising, their mouths were full of bitter execrations. You can imagine what they were saying afterwards. Christopher Brooke, a major investor in the Virginia Company, the, the joint stock company that uh, uh, had established Jamestown, wrote a long poem. Uh, in the middle of it, he referred to uh, Virginia's Indian neighbors as errors of nature, of inhumane birth, the very dregs, garbage, and spawn of earth. And then ending the poem on a more positive note, an encouraging note, cheerleading for uh, the Jamestown colonists, he wrote, take heart and fill your veins. The next that bleeds shall be those fiends. And for each drop of ours, I strongly hope, we will shed theirs in showers. Waterhouse famously wrote, 
Our hands, which before were tied with gentleness and fair usage, are now set at liberty. We may now, by right of war and law of nations, invade their country, then enjoy their cultivated spaces, while reducing the Indians to, quote, servitude and drudgery. But there was a problem, because there still weren't that many Englishmen, a lot less than there had been on March 21st. Um, the ratio was still something like 20,000 plus to 700. So it's one thing to talk big, it's another thing to, to survive uh, another few days of warfare in the face of such odds. And of course, the Powhatans knew the terrain a lot better than did the English. Well, uh, the English response was drawn on long experience going back at least to uh, the Hundred Years' War during which they had successfully conquered at that time much of France. Um, they waged what uh, various Englishmen called harsh visits and feed fights. They waged war against corn. They waited until harvest time and then they attacked. They certainly were willing to kill Powhatan men. They didn't focus so much on Powhatan women because those were the farmers in this society. And the real target were the cornfields. They cut everything down. They put as much corn as they could in the holds of their ships. And then they burned the rest. And then hoped that the women would come back and plant the next year because Powhatan people, like everyone else, need to eat every year. And they repeated this every season for 10 straight years until 1632. This strategy was nicely captured by another poet who um, chose to remain anonymous for reasons that will be clear when I read you his poem. Um, among other things, he wrote, from James his town, well shipped and stored, up river did they sail, long ere they came to shore, who landing slew those enemies that massacred our men, took prisoners, corn, and burnt their towns, and came aboard again. So um, that was pretty much it for 10 years of warfare, uh, except for one uh, pitched battle in 1624 in which the English mustered all the men they could. Um, John Smith claimed it was a pretty small group. I think he said it was 68. Uh, and the Pamunkeys fielded as many men as they could. John Smith also said there were over 800 of them. I think both are exaggerations, but uh, because the, 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 the battle went on for two days and it was a draw. Uh, so they, they fought each other to a standstill. What concluded this battle, again, was not or con what we would consider conventional warfare on the field of battle, but rather the moment when a detachment of Englishmen sneaked away to the fields and lit, lit, uh, lit them on fire. And after that point, the uh, Powhatan warriors were really dispirited and gave up the field. Well, it's fair to ask, so what? That's actually a scholarly question. We always want to know about historical significance. What were the consequences of this? And what insight do we gain from this? And again, to stick with the, the consensus answer, um, to quote Eric Foner, the author of a textbook, okay, which is a pretty nice summary of the existing scholarship. Um, the 1622 attacks and the successful English response to those attacks, quote, shifted the balance of power, ensuring the settlers' supremacy. Henceforth, Indians would be subordinated to the English. So I, I don't think there's much wrong with this story. Um, the various people have written about this. We can talk about the details. We can debate how important this English missionary activity was and so forth. But I think the uh, difficulty with the story as it's been told um, boils down to uh, what's not in it, not what's wrong with it. Uh, well, first of all, the th thing that's missing is a good book about it. There was a really good dissertation. Well, no, I mean, everyone writes about it, but they're always on their way somewhere else, right? So no one's really focused on this, um, and I think it deserves that. The, uh, J. Frederick Faust wrote a brilliant dissertation in 1977 at the College of William and Mary and published some great articles um, and then went into college administration and... <laughs> We'll see. <laughs> um, so uh, no, it would have been a great book, and I'm sorry he didn't publish it, but someone needs to. And I think uh, it, 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 it's, it's a story that really deserves a dual audience. Um, certainly it deserves a popular audience. You know, I've, I've been through these records over and over again. I can tell you any half-decent writer, which is probably about where I am, 50%, could make it a good story. 
Uh, but I think, too, I'd like for the book that results from this year here to say something new to scholars. It's kind of indicative that we don't really have a good name for this event. I called it the Powhatan Uprising on the first slide, but you notice on the poster it has quotation marks, again, you know, the irony marks around it. Um, the, it used to be called a massacre, and there are real problems with that. Um, it's just really old-fashioned, and it's, it's such a loaded term when you're talking about Indians doing the fighting. Um, I don't think uprising is right, because for the Powhatans to rise up, they would have had to be on the bottom in the first place, and I've made it pretty clear they weren't. The anthropologist Frederick Gleach has called it a coup, and I think that comes closest to the mark, but uh, it's been 15 years since he trotted out this term, and that hasn't caught on, and so I'd have to think about the reasons for that. Uh, before, I, before I adopted it, because I want what I write to catch on. So, um, uh, uh, but I think it's just indicative that there's no real good name for it. Um, so I'll think about that in the next year, or if in the Q&A period you guys want to give me a title, that would be great. Um, in a nutshell, though, what's missing from the story as it's been told is Native American history. Now, that may sound odd, since Native Americans have figured pretty prominently in the stories I've told it so far. It's the history, I think, that's missing. It turns out that, um, well, Native American history didn't begin in 1607. Take that term, coup, okay? Um, Frederick Leach uh, introduced this term to account for a mystery because, you see, on March 22nd, the Powhatans were hot for war. On March 23rd, they were nowhere to be seen. They did not press their advantage. They could have swept the English into the sea given another six to 12 hours, maybe more. But you know, I mean, they, they, they met some resistance at Jamestown and a few places, but the advantage was so overwhelming that had they fought like Englishmen, there would have been no more Englishmen. And so why was that? Well, um, Gleach says that, that this was a coup, a corrective blow, a slap upside the head to tell the English, here is your place. Uh, this is a map from his book, and uh, I'm sure you can't see much, but trust me when I describe what's on it, okay? Um, in the lower left-hand corner, you have these shaded areas that indicate areas of English settlement in 1622 all along the James River, okay? And you'll notice that it covers most of the James River below the fall line. Those little hash marks show where the attacks came. And you'll notice that in the down, near the downriver settlements, there were fewer attacks than near the upriver settlements. So uh, Gleach is saying, well, they, you know, the, the, the Powhatans were trying to say, no, you're coming too close to the Powhatan heartland. You're coming too close to our core area near the fall line. Um, but also, uh, on, a, on a broader level, according to Gleach, the plan was to put the English in their place politically to say, no, your visitor's here, this is our country, and you are uh, subordinate to, or at best, a little old colony uh, in the midst of us that's tolerated. All right, so um, I think there's actually much more to be said about this than, than Gleach did. Um, I'll just throw out one example of this. Um, another check on Powhatan warfare, another check that prevented uh, this, this uh, coup from turning into a sustained military campaign was that Powhatan warriors required considerable ritual preparation before they went to war and considerable cleansing afterwards. So this would put a real check on the number of engagements that any one person uh, or, or, or the men of any one lineage could fight in. So that's just one example. The broader point here is that um, the Powhatan way of war was very different from that of the English and that they didn't invent it in 1622 or in 1607, but rather that it was the product of a long Indian-only history in the region. Okay, so as I said, Native American history didn't begin in 1607. Powhatan ways of war didn't originate in 1607, and neither did the story of the 1622 um, attacks. We need to go back at a minimum to the 1560s, which is when Powhatan, uh, then roughly 20 years old, inherited six subordinate chieftains, mostly clustered near the falls of the York and James Rivers. Six. When the English showed up, 
1607, they had up, he had upwards of 30 subordinate chiefs, owing some degree of allegiance to him, certainly tribute, uh, uh, and was who, you know, all of whom were locked in uh, a kind of a reciprocal relationship that, that, that had him as the paramount chief and them as chiefs only within their own nations. So that's a lot, from six to somewhere in the low 30s. And in fact, he added another one for good measure a year after the Jamestown colonists showed up. So again, just as a sample of what I might do with this in the book, um, I think that this rapid, I mean, this tremendous upward trajectory of the Powhatan paramount chiefdom helps to explain um, <laughs> the utter confidence, uh, the, the presumed mastery of his successor Atoyatin and their brother Apicancanu in launching these attacks in 1622. You know, I mean, they were like, they were like 33 and 0. So how were the English going to change that? Well, I misspoke a minute ago when I said what's missing from most accounts of this event is um, Native American history because I should say histories in the plural. This slide um, just uh, gives a, a, a sense that there were different Indian nations in this region, that not everyone was a Powhatan, and the real map would be much more crowded, okay? Um, and so uh, what we've got here is uh, uh, a situation, well, it's not a two-sided story. I mean, you know that expression, there are two sides to every story? That's almost never true. I mean, even if you have like a beef with your dad, your mom might be somewhere, your uncle, your friends, grandma, right? There's almost never two sides to a story. And in this case, even if we stay on the level of, you know, the individual polity, the individual Indian nations, there are 30 plus sides to this story. What side do you think the Akahanics were on? The Akahanics side, right? What side do you think the Potomacs were on? The Potomacs side, of course. When we keep in mind that the Powhatan's paramount chieftain, see, had grown tremendously over the preceding, what is it, 50 years, we realize all of a sudden, hey, a lot of people in a lot of these towns could remember when they had not been Powhatans or had heard from their parents when they weren't, that they weren't Powhatans. And often, they could remember that they never wanted to be Powhatans in the first place because people were absorbed into this paramount chieftain by a variety of means. You know, at one extreme, there were apparently uh, uh, groups that were very much happy to join in this larger, more powerful union. But there were others who didn't like it at all. And there were still others just beyond that, for example, in southern Maryland and on the eastern shore, who were afraid that they were next. So the Chesapeake Bay region was full of reluctant Powhatans and people who feared the Powhatan menace. This Again, just to sample a little bit of how this plays out in the book, this really changes our understanding of, what, uh, of the conduct of the War of 1622 to 1632. Because I skipped something in my first narrative. The first thing the English did after they kind of regrouped and you know, huddled together in Jamestown and a couple of other secure settlements, the first thing they did was not think about how they were going to attack the Powhatans. The first thing they did was ask, what are we gonna eat this year? And so Governor uh, Francis Wyatt gave commissions to a number of ship's captains to spread throughout the Chesapeake Bay region, all up the rivers, to find people who were willing to trade corn to the English. And they found them. They found them mostly amongst those reluctant Powhatans and people just beyond the, 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 the boundaries of Powhatan's paramount chieftaincy. They found them on the eastern shore. Okay? People from the western shore, even then, came here for the produce, right? Um, and they found it on the Potomac River and even on the Rappahannock River. Okay, so what does all this suggest about the consequences of 1622? How does this change potentially our answer to the question of so what? The conventional answer, you'll recall, is that the English, um, and here I'm quoting J. Frederick Faust, had vanquished the Powhatans and would from then on stand alone as successful colonizers. It's a nice nuanced statement because it recognizes that the Powhatans were colonizers as well. But the Powhatans were vanquished by the English and the English would from now on stand as alone as successful colonizers. Well, here's a map from one of um, the anthropologist Helen Roundtree's books from 1646 and you notice there are still a lot of Indian nations on it. <laughs> um, so uh, that's kind of odd if 
if the Powhatans and if native Virginians were truly vanquished uh, in the War of 1622 to 1632? Uh, the answer, of course, to this mystery is that they weren't. Um, let's, let's rethink who the winners and losers were in this war. I find it hard to find anyone who was truly vanquished in this war. The people who had it hardest were those who were really among the core nations of the Powhatan paramount chiefdom. But even they weren't vanquished. They were reduced, but not vanquished. The treaty that end the war, ended the war, we don't have the original of it, but the summary of it from a 19th century historian's notes um, gives no indication that it contained any humiliating provisions or confessions of defeat on the part of the Powhatans. And in fact, after the war, the Powhatans were still far more numerous than the English. They were still far more numerous than any of, of, of the other independent Indian nations in the region. Uh, and uh, they still maintained, for the most part, the same way of life, the same culture, the same food ways, the same political system, same way of reckoning kinship, the whole bit. So uh, the Powhatans are not as well off as before, but they're doing okay after 1632. If there were really winners in this conflict, I would have to say it's the reluctant Powhatans who gained their independence through this war, uh, especially since they were not, uh, they tended not to be living so close to the English and not have to deal with their hogs running wild in the woods and all this stuff. Um, they, even more than the Powhatans, were able to go back to uh, the way they were. The English, too, were winners um, to a certain extent. They, uh, they too, maintained their traditional ways. Uh, ways of reckoning kinship and so forth, and um, the James River Valley was mostly safe for them after this. There were still Indian nations among them and you know, are to this day along the James River, uh, but uh, uh, they, they were relatively safe from attack with a few exceptions um, several decades down the road. But I think that this accounting of winners and losers really isn't the best way to assess the significance of this war because the major legacy, I would argue, of this war was the transformation of a failed colony called Jamestown into a successful new colony called Virginia. Um, many of you know that the March 22 attacks set in motion uh, an, an official investigation that ended with the Jamestown, uh, with the Virginia Company losing its charter. In 1624, the colony became Virginia, a crown colony. But of equal or greater importance, the decade-long Anglo-Powhatan War led to the concentration of wealth and political power in the hands of a small cadre of men. Virtually all of the men who led expeditions against the Powhatans during these harsh visits and feed fights, okay. it's an earlier harsh visit and feed fight from 1613, but it's the best burning corn slide I can find. Okay. Um, the men who, virtually all of the men who led these expeditions served on the governor's council which was an, a tremendously influential position that combined aspects of being on the cabinet and being in the Senate. It was these men who, as counselors, decided when to raid Powhatan fields. And it was these men who decided who would be the captains who led these expeditions. And generally, if they were physically able to do so, they decided that, well, they were the best men to do it. And as is so often the case in war, uh, when they took loot, ships full of corn, officers got a bigger share than anyone else, and the captain especially got more corn than anyone else. So what would a captain do with all that corn? I mean, I like corn, but it, by the end of the summer, I'm kind of sick of it. And if that's all I had to eat all year, you know, a ship full of it, I wouldn't like corn anymore. Uh, well, the thing is, of course, that these men also owned land and lots of servants. And so they used this corn to sustain their dependents, servants, and in a few cases already slaves, which freed those, those laborers to grow tobacco, which could then be sold for export. And so it's a bit of a feedback loop here. A political decision is made that has economic consequences that leads to the further enrichment of the men who made the political decision. Control of unfree laborers, of course, was the key to wealth and power in 17th century Virginia. Now, doesn't that sound kind of familiar? Because what I've just described is Virginia as we know it today, colonial Virginia as we know it today, through countless written histories, through field trips to you know, historic St. Mary's City or to colonial Williamsburg, 
It's a plantation society characterized by large-scale production of something that's bad for you for export to another continent. Okay? Here it's tobacco, elsewhere it would be sugar, coffee. It's characterized by um, masses of unfree laborers, initially mostly servants, eventually slaves. And it's characterized by the political, economic, and social dominance of a small cadre of elite planters. In other words, Virginia was not established in 1607. Virginia was forged in war from 1622 to 1632. That's when it was established. The new Virginia that emerged from the war was what really started to do serious damage to Native American populations in the Chesapeake Bay region. The war itself, as, as I've suggested, was damaging, especially to the Powhatans, but kind of a mixed bag for Indians as a whole. But the plantation society that took root and grew under the direction of this cadre of powerful Virginians, that proved harder to stop. And by the 1640s, the real damage to First Nations was starting to be done. So this is not Jamestown, this is Virginia. What we have here, I think, are the roots of an American pattern that was ultimately replicated elsewhere, uh, first to a certain degree in Maryland, and later to a certain degree throughout the American South. We have here the origins of the American South. That's, um, as some of you recognize, an exaggeration. There are other examples in the Caribbean and so forth. But this is an important source, an important wellspring of this particular kind of society. And I'd like to conclude by pointing out that Indians were central to the formation of this society. Again, the conventional wisdom has been that the Anglo-Powhatan Wars cleared out Indians and made room for Englishmen to do what Englishmen do, which is create this kind of plantation society. But if I'm right, in fact, it's this particular war that forged Virginia in a particular way. It's a consequence then, this Virginia and this new Virginia, of, uh, uh, of uh, a war fought in tension against Indians. To, uh, I'll finish by quoting the title of a forthcoming book. This is actually the cover art for this book um, from the University of North Carolina Press. In this case, as in many other cases down to the present, which would be, I guess, the subject of my course in the spring, you can't teach U.S. history without American Indians. Thank you. How much time for questions? Yes. Yeah, how much time? Okay, good. Okay, I'm told we have 15 minutes for questions, um, and uh, I'll, um, if I forget to restate the question for the folks who are recording this, please remind me or just bellow it so that you can hear it. Okay, so questions, please. Yes. I've read that uh, in the north, in Massachusetts, much of the devastation of the Indians came from disease. Mm -hmm. I haven't heard at all about that in Virginia. Course. Yeah. Um, this was kind of news to historians in the 1970s. Um, anthropologists had been writing about the devastating effects of in newly introduced diseases um, really for much of the 20th century. Uh, mostly focusing on Mexico and California. And uh, historians kind of caught on to this in the late 60s. And um, you know, so, so for, for several decades, you could read about virgin soil epidemics that essentially ran out ahead of, of colonists and you know, killed 80, 90, 95% of the native people who had never encountered, say, smallpox or influenza. And um, uh, uh, that turns out to have happened in Virginia. I mean, I'm sorry, in, uh, in New England, uh, primarily because you had a lot of uh, uh, activity, uh, maritime activity in the area, especially with the fisheries up in Newfoundland and so forth. Um, but it also turns out to have been an exaggeration for other areas because, you know, Englishmen, Spaniards, they weren't immune to smallpox. If they were, they never could have carried it to America in the first place, right? So when you really look at how these, uh, the, the, the most devastating of these diseases act, um, you realize that in most instances, if there was smallpox on board a ship or influenza on board a ship, it would have burned itself out by the time it reached the Americas. Uh, and that seems to have been the case in Virginia. Uh, as 
as, I, as far as I can reckon, and this is a part of my first book on the Potomac Basin, um, epidemic diseases really started to hit Native people in the Chesapeake hard in a big way, I mean, in a devastating way, in about the 1650s, it took that long. And uh, there, may, there, there probably were a few cases um, in the 1610s where this happened, but they were pretty much contained within individual communities. And people can recover from a devastating epidemic. It may not seem like it at the time when half of your town has died, but people do recover. I mean, look at, you know, Europe bounced back from the Black Death. So uh, 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 by the time these diseases hit, the real problem for the native peoples of Virginia and Maryland was colonialism. The disease only made a bad situation worse. Yes. Um, were there any Native Americans that had already, like, somehow stopped part of the English um, society, and how were they affected when that happened? Okay, so the question was, were there already any Native Americans who had become, I guess, uh, integrated into, or an established part, you said, of uh, English society? Individuals, yes. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's, this is really hard to get at. The, the, the nature of the records doesn't really lend itself to, 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 to you know, looking into the hearts and minds of such people. Uh, but um, we know that, uh, that there was a lot of interaction, that uh, the last 20 years or so of, of investigations at Jamestown, for example, which I think some of you are going to be visiting as part of a class soon, uh, have shown just in a very just concrete, material way that, that um, this boundary between Indians and colonists was extremely porous because James, the Jamestown Fort was chock full of Indian stuff. Um, so we know that there were plenty of occasions for that kind of connection to be made, and we know that there were people who were working, Native people who were working in English households, but again, whether that meant that they were, that they felt English or anything like that, um, that's really hard to say. So how were those Indian rela uh, individual relations affected by the attack? Uh, well, um, they were called off for the time being. The governor um, had to, ha well, maybe not entirely, because the governor felt it necessary on at least one occasion to remind people that they needed to be a little careful about letting Native people, you know, stay in their houses, um, and required that they get permission from a local militia commander uh, before they did that. Uh, so, so there was less of it, but um, uh, after the war, uh, certainly, and um, uh, uh, the fact that the war was going on so long militated against it, but it wasn't en entirely ended. I think the real, um, the real end date to a lot of meaningful interaction between um, Indians and colonists, where it was really reciprocal, getting to know each other sort of thing, um, came after the 1660s, and then it was on the part of the English. Um, before then, they'd like learned Engl Indian languages and so forth, and after about like the 1670s, 1680s, almost no English people know the language. And so it's at that point that, 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 that if there is a connection between an English person and an Indian, um, it's the Indians coming to English society, English culture, English language, rather than the other way around. I'm not sure it answers your question, but. <laughs> yeah. Other questions, please. Um, okay, so in the corner first. Um, so after a few years of these, uh, I forget what you call them, these fights, mm -hmm. do you have evidence that the, the Palaam responded, adapted to these things, that they, that they uh, you know, essentially after five years of this, or nine years of yeah. this, by year 10, it seems like they would have yeah, absolutely. Um, the strategy was to, to retreat to places that weren't so close to navigable portions of the rivers. So rather than being on the James, they went into uh, the um, York River drainage. And rather than being on the York, lower York, they tended to retreat above the fall line at West Point. So I think you know, one of the revisions I'd like to offer is I don't think that the Powhatan population declined as precipitously as some have said. I think that they actually um, shifted around some to more defensible areas. And you know, that required some changes as far as, like, well, less fish. Um, you know, it required some changes to the, to the subsistence cycle and so forth, but um, they seem to have made those adjustments. And yes. 
Uh, so the question was, the Indians didn't have any written language at the time, uh, did they? Um, no, not really. I'm just curious, how does one like yourself delve into the, the history mm -hmm. of the Indians before the arrival of uh, Europeans? Yeah, um, right. I mean, so my colleagues in 20th century history, they have the problem of way too much evidence, more than they can ever look at. A friend of mine wrote a book about um, a dissertation about um, Nixon and the environment, and when he went to the National Archives, uh, the archivist showed him to a room full of boxes, and uh, those of you who remember Watergate will understand how odd this is. He said, these are H.R. Haldeman's papers on the environment. H.R. Haldeman had nothing to do with environmental issues, but he had a room full of papers on it. Whereas we have to, the further you go back in history, and it's not unique to people who study Native America, but the further back you go in history, the more creative you have to be to sque at squeezing a lot out of that, so that when you get to people who do like ancient Greece, now that's some creative detective work. So um, specifically, um, uh, I, we have to do a lot of, of, of reading against the grain of written documents. So we have documents that were written by John Smith and we have to figure out what 12-year-old Pocahontas was thinking. Um, and this is a term that was coined by women's historians uh, in the uh, 1960s who faced the very same problem, right? So there's a lot, of, uh, uh, there's a lot, a lot more, uh, it's, it, the sources don't give things up as easily. You kind of have to comb them backwards um, to find stuff. Uh, I make a lot of use of archaeology. There are a few precious snippets of oral history, uh, more now than there were 20 years ago, actually, because it's it's uh, because Native peoples in both in both states are much more forthcoming about uh, sharing those oral histories and recording them and so forth. Um, and then uh, finally, there are what um, historians often call side streaming or upstreaming. So uh, I can, some of the things I have to say about Powhatan ways of war are derived from what we know about Piscata way of ways of war, but all evidence is that they're roughly the same. And so you know, with some caution, I use those. Upstreaming, you do sort of the same thing where, for example, uh, in um, 1705, Robert Beverly, writing the first real history of Virginia, um, wrote an explanation for the layout of Virginia Indian towns that, bingo, helps to account, or the very nicely accounts for what archeologists can see on the ground during their excavations for the 17th century and even the 16th century. So, uh, I, there was one question over here, I think, and then, sorry, two, and then Adam. Okay. So, yours, please. In uh, New England and upstate New York, Cherry Valley and Deerfield, you see a swarm of Indians coming down. Yeah. The way I envision the James River plantations, or at least the Berkeley plantation, there was some of the members of the household mm -hmm. that turned against the owner. Yeah. And they did damage there, but it was not a mob uprising. It was more or less infiltration. Yeah, absolutely. Um, although, uh, in uh, the best known uh, uh, New England war, um, King Philip's war, Medicom's war, there, there was a little bit of both. Uh, but you're, yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, the, the vulnerability of the English in Jamestown was that they, they thought they were getting along just fine. Well, maybe that's an exaggeration, but they thought it was safe. Yeah. And then I guess, yes, please. Just a word for reprisal. Reprisal. So that there was not a question, but a statement. A, a different word for this would be a reprisal. Yeah. Uh, Adam? Yeah, if I can claim a quick final question, knowing that people have plenty more chance to talk to you in the yeah. next uh, nine months, luckily. Um, you, you were talking about evidence, and you mentioned archaeology a few minutes ago, and um, some of the most dramatic and even gruesome discoveries in American historical archaeology were made about this massacre, uh, yeah. massacre assault uprising. Yeah. I wonder if um, you could maybe quickly describe that and talk about whether that's going to be an important part of the story that you tell, whether that even gets the native perspective on it a little bit. Um, well, absolutely. And uh, years ago, um, Colonial Williamsburg had this wonderful secondary outpost. Um, Ed, can you remind me of the name of uh, Carter's Grove? Carter's Grove, thank you. And, and, and which was a great public history venue for a lot of reasons. Cause, but um, uh, uh, I remember going there and seeing the archaeological collections uh, uh, that centered around the devastation at Martin's Hundred, which was um, arguably the part of the Jamestown colony that was the hardest hit by this. And so I'm very eager, actually, to get back down there and to look at those, um, although, sadly, I think 
some of your undergraduates will be there to see them before I will. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thanks very much. that wonderful talk. If I can make one quick final announcement, the publicity for this talk advertised a book signing afterwards of Jim's last book on Bacon's Rebellion, that other dramatic and violent episode in early Virginia history. Unfortunately, the books didn't arrive in time, um, but Jim will be signing s some copies that'll be available starting, I think, tomorrow in the Washington College Bookstore. And also, if you'd like to have a copy personalized, you'd be very welcome to bring one down to the Custom House. We'll get it to Jim, and then we'll make sure that it gets back to you. Thanks.